Welcome back, everybody, to the Sick Podcast Recruits Draftcast. We got another fun show in store for you today. We've been seeing the discourse on social media, mainly Twitter X, about a certain player who plays for the Spokane Chiefs, who a lot of people say, uh, well, they, they question you guys about not wanting him on your wish list. So we're going to get to him uh, in just a few moments. As always, Rocco, you got Rocco's Riser of the Week. We got our Prospect of the Week and our Habs Prospect of the Week coming up. Let's get to it. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to the Sick Podcast. The Sick Podcast. Recruits Draft Cast. And with the first overall selection in the 2023 NHL Draft, the Chicago Blackhawks are very proud to select from the Regina Pats, the Western Hockey League, Connor Bedard. The sickest NHL Draft and Scouting Podcast. It's gonna be sick. Producer Shane here reporting for duty, joined by my fantastic co-host, Grant McCag, Rocco Zappia. Gentlemen, how are we today? Great. How are you doing? Can't complain. Can't complain. I'm hearing the birds outside. Sun is shining. The snow is melting. Uh, I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm loving this. I'm loving this weather. Uh, time, springtime is always my favorite. So, uh, And, and yeah. it's it smells like playoffs, too. You know, playoffs are creeping in. Uh, the best time of the year, man. I love it. Can't complain. <laughs> Whenever at seven, whenever it's light out at seven o'clock, I think playoff hockey. That's why this time change that Same, they changed yeah. it yeah. used to be like around April first, if I'm not mistaken, and they moved it up in recent years, where it's a little sooner now that the time change is. Mm. But it all, I always used to equate it with, uh, okay, it's hockey games are starting in in yeah. the daylight, playoff time, baby. Well, it's, it. it's almost my my favorite time of the year where I get to keep my hockey bag and my golf bag in the car. Yes. So yeah. You never know. You could be doing both in, in the same day. You get about a month of crossover, I mean, unless you play in a summer league, but I don't care. No. So, <laughs> so <laughs> why, why do my golf why do my golf clubs smell like hockey sweat? Yeah, Oof. yeah, yeah. That's always Oof. always good. My golf yeah. clubs stink, but not as bad <laughs> as my golf game does, so that's fine. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, I think yeah. I think we all struggle with the with the short game. It's all good uh, stuff to work on in the summer. But uh, gentlemen, there's been a lot of traction, a lot of discussion regarding one of our our latest episodes, um, where you both came up with your wish lists. Grant, you had your wish list for the Habs, and Rocco, you had your wish list for the Sens in regards to this year's draft. And I've seen a lot of people on Twitter and all that saying that. Berkeley Catton is their choice, right? I mean, you look at the stats, it's understandable. Uh, 50 goals, 57 assists in, in 63 games for 107 points. And that's always enticing, right? But you both omitted him from your wish list. So let's talk about it a little. Grant, I know you want to kick us off. So yeah. Let's get no, to it. No, we're going to let Rocco. Uh, we're going to oh. let Rocco <laughs> Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. You missed the meeting. You missed the meeting two minutes before, didn't you? You weren't let you were tuned out again, as usual. Shane. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, well, I tell you, Shane, just set me up to get railroaded. That's fine. That's okay. No, and like I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I don't like Berkeley Catton because I do. I like him. He's a yeah. he's a real nice, real nice player, real good prospect. He brings a ton of skill, ton of high and offense. His vision's great, his edges are great. He creates, he's dangerous both ways. He can shoot it too. I mean, I I do get I do get the admiration for for his game. But there's probably to me 12, 12 guys, I think, who have legitimate stake to claim a top ten spot in this year's draft. And and two of them, two of them aren't aren't gonna be in the top ten. Yeah. For me, where the separation comes, there's a couple things. And and part and part of it is admittedly, so for me, my biggest, like what I think probably my biggest scouting bias is is against size i don't care generally for smaller players and that's something that i'll like i'll admit i know that's an area that i i overlook and the times when i'm really wrong on a guy it's often someone very small um that i didn't give enough credit to and i don't want to do that with him but at the same time like let's just see in june what kind of what kind of makeup the teams have that are left and do you want and everyone's gonna say oh yeah Sidney crosby's 510 connor is 510 that's fine 
he's not he's not Sidney Crosby and he's not Connor Bedard. There's a certain skill level where it doesn't matter how big you are, you're just the best, you're just the best, and that's just how it is. Mm-hmm. And he's he's not like he's he's a very good player, but he's not that level. So the size matters a little bit. Do I want to be small? Do I want to be small down the middle? If I'm building a team, if I'm investing a really high draft pick on a kid, do I want to make my team small down the middle? Because if you're picking a top 10 pick on a kid, you need him to be in your top two lines or you need him to be on your top two pairs. At worst, ideally your first line or your first pair. So is that the makeup of the team that you want? And that's when I'm saying myself thinking, okay, well, you've got these six defensemen who are all extremely good, all over six feet, or better, and the sm- the guys who are six feet is maybe the most talented one. And you've got Lindstrom, you've got Demidov, who might be the best offensive player in the draft. You've got Celebrini. Okay, so that's nine. You got again was right in that right in that mix. He's doing it night in, night out. You've got mm-hmm. the Eisman kid, who you know a lot of people still think is a top ten pick, who might be the best pure goal scorer in the draft. So where does Catton rank? It's not an indictment on Catton. There's a lot of, there's really good players in this draft. And if I'm building my team, you know, when everyone says take the best player available and that's, and that's fine, but we need to appreciate how close, like how close in ability these guys are and how little there is to discern them, especially when they're playing in in different leagues, right? It's, it's hard. There's not a top, top 10 that I can think of where the top 10 picks made ended up being the top 10, same top 10 players in order 10 years down the line, right? So there's nuance to it. And it's it's a little more complicated than pick the best player available. So Catton plays like a center. He's got tremendous skill. But do I want to build a team that is small down the middle? And for me personally, I, I don't. When there are positions that are maybe harder to fill or harder to find um, that are available for guys that just – maybe philosophically suit what you want to do a little better. Now, that said, is it going to shock me if if you hear Berkeley Cotton go number six or seven or whatever over? No, I'm not going to be shocked. and I'm not going to think whatever team did it is is dumb. It's just it wouldn't be my preference when you have when you have 12 guys who are worthy of being top 10 picks, two of them, two of them can't be. Um, and, and for me, that's just where it is. But again, I, I do have a bit of a size bias and, and maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe he'll be one of the top five best players. He has the skill to do it, but I want a big team. I want a, t- a team that's big down the middle and big on, on D. And if we're going to have a, a little bit of small skill, I'd like it to be on, on the wing. And maybe that's what happens. Who knows? But there's just, there's just guys that suit what I personally would want to build around a little bit better. Grant, did you uh, did you want to chime in? Jeez, that's not what you told me before the podcast. There, I, but you, I think you. Are, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, I think you, you, you. When I told you that I pulled a few NHL scouts, I think you probably figured out what, which way they lean. <laughs> um, well, well, like I, I mean, I, I haven't had him in the top ten. Okay, ten at all. He's, he's right on the fringe there for me. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's that not was like my turn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't call me out then I'll let me explain myself <laughs> I'm just kidding buddy no uh yeah exactly he's he's on the cusp of the top 10 I mean you can make mm-hmm. that argument sure but there's 11 or 10 excellent prospects for this draft that both of us just happen to like a little more we've got similar I think we've got a similar top 10 or 11 and, uh, you know, you have to go with it. If we're in agreement, we're certainly not going to change it up because people on Twitter are saying, you know, it should be different. right? <laughs> and especially when you get confirmation from NHL scouts. I, I polled five. I polled five scouts today. And uh, every one of them, I asked them, is Catton in your top 10? And they all said no. So, I mean, that goes along with what what we're saying, right? Um, none of them said that he's not, is a poor prospect that, you know, the, the, the biggest criticism is just scared about his size at 5'10", 170. He's slight. He's not only undersized height wise, but he's slight. Uh, yeah. he doesn't go to the, in the traffic, uh, with zeal in part because of his size. Right. Um, Riley height last year scored 97 points basically the same size as uh as Catton. he went in the 60s at the draft 
and he's got 107 points this year, very similar. You're not drafting guys to put to try to win a Memorial Cup championship. You're not drafting to have the best junior team. If you were, Catton would go top three, maybe, you know. But, you no, know, you're trying to draft a team that's going to help you win in the NHL playoffs. The bottom line. How many teams – I think you got an idea of – what the Canadian when Hughes took over, what were the first two major acquisitions for the top six? Six four, Yuri Slavkovsky drafted first overall. Six four, Kirby Doc, mm. right? That tells you that the direction that they're they think that they needed they needed size need size in the top. Okay, so there's two of them, right? If you've got Joshua. Berkeley Catton, Cole Caulfield. New hook. And, eh? New hook. New hook. So you've got Caulfield, you've got Suzuki, Catton, right? Four and Wa. All are under the NHL average size. Mm -hmm. The average size of an NHL player is 6'1, 200 plus pounds. They are all under six feet, actually. You could argue, well, Suzuki, yeah, you see the height measurements. Both Suzuki and Wa are 5'11 and a half at best. Even if you say they're six feet, it's still smaller than the average NHL size. So that's four undersized forwards in your top six. You, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find, you know, you'll find the rare exception if you go back, but top eight playoff teams, through the years, if you want to go back and study, there's very, very, very few that have four guys under the average size in HL. Like you looked at Florida last year, you know, Barkov, Kachuk, uh, you know, you go on and on. Bennett, there yeah. weren't four guys undersized. There were four guys bigger than the average. Vegas, same deal, you know, Stone, Eichel, uh, you know, you, you, you name these guys. There's not four guys under... Yes, uh, average size. It's the opposite. So, ideally, you're looking in the top ten. You're you, you're trying to get, find guys that are going to play in your top six. They're going to help you play win at playoff time. Montreal already has three guys that you know it looks like are going to be in the top six, and the, and the other guy that is potentially down the road is Meshar. Well, he's five ten. Another, you know, it just doesn't make sense to add yet another 5'10 guy to that you hope is going to help you win a Stanley Cup for your top six. As much as I like Catton, as skilled as he is, as great as a junior player he is, you're not drafting a Memorial Cup team. You're, you're drafting a Stanley Cup team is what the goal is. And... For that, for those reasons, that's why I don't didn't have him on the wish list of the Canadians. Now, if, uh, if they decide, well, we're not taking another defenseman, uh, and again was gone, and it's their pick, and you know, well, we're going to take the top forward on our list, and it's Cat, and okay, I guess I get it, but I'd be surprised. I really would, given what we've seen so far from the Canadians. With, with with acquiring Doc and Slavkowski as I think that they want another, they would like another good size forward if they go that route, uh, unless it's you know unless they end up with the first overall pick and it's Macklin Celebrini, and again <laughs> <Easy. Yeah. laughs> you're talking about a special player as as good a junior a, as Catton is Celebrini's a, a tier above him, so yeah. uh, and and the same goes with Demidov who is also a lot thicker, stronger kid and an inch, at least an inch taller than, than Catton. So, um, I mean, Central's list, Central's list is the one you go by for, for height size. And he's 5'10". That's what he is. He's not 5'11". You'll see, you probably even see some uh, places that list him at six feet or whatever, probably in the WHL. You always see, oh yeah, he's six foot. No, he's 5'10", 170 pounds. Um, I, I heard some comp comparisons to 
Ryan Nugent Hopkins. Now, a 5'10 version of Ryan Nugent Hopkins. You know, Nugent Hopkins, six foot and slight. And there's some similarities to their game. So if he turns out to be a Ryan Nugent Hopkins at 5'10 version, that, that's pretty damn good, right? Yeah. But Ryan Nugent Hopkins, uh, you know, at the end of the day, he's on the wing, right? He's playing uh, beside uh, beside McDavid. Yeah, he's putting up good points. And I'm sure if Catton or anybody played with McDavid, they put up good points too. But uh, um, so he's a good prospect. I mean, mm -hmm. but in this draft, do you want to, you know, there's six, three defensemen that are putting up crazy good points that are good skaters that are big, that, that, you know, they're more valuable uh, uh, in the top 10 than a 5'10 center who may or may not play as a top two center in the NHL. I think a lot of NHL guys feel that he's, if he's going to play in your top six, it's likely going to be on the wing. So there, there are more valuable assets to select in the top 10. And certainly in the top eight where both Ottawa and Montreal are at this point. Yeah. It just doesn't, doesn't seem like it, you know, that's the right fit for either team in the top eight. And that's no slight on Berkeley Catton. Again, we, we love the top 11 and he's one of those top 11. Yeah. He just happens to be number 11. So, <laughs> you know, that's, I think that's is best that we can explain why he wasn't on our wish list. Um, not that, you know, he'd be a poor choice for any team after the top mm -hmm. six in the draft, I don't think. No, that's it. And and like Rocco mentioned, right, it's also a testament to how deep this draft class is. And if if there were no Caden Lindstrom, no Ivan Demonov, no Zane Perek, all that, you'd, you'd yeah. see Berkeley maybe in the top five, right? Talent-wise, mm -hmm. he's, he's proved it. But this draft class is just yeah. so deep that you can get a guy who's putting up 107 – 107 points in 63 games outside of the yeah. top 10, right? How, like, that's very impressive. Well, I, I believe I mentioned that too, Shane, but sure, give the... Give the give <laughs> Rocco the said it first. <laughs> give the water to the <laughs> Yeah, you tried to set him up, yeah. so I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll yeah, give yeah, him a no, bone no, there. No. Yeah. I'll give yeah, him a bone. Fair. But that, that's it. I mean, I remember seeing ba Berkeley Catton at the Linka Gretzky, right? And he put up a, a goal a game. A goal every single game. He was the captain of that team, led them to the gold, right? Just he's a fantastic player. Like anybody who who goes in the comments here and says that oh, we're shitting on him. He, we, you know, we think he sucks. No, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Right. It like like you said, if you if that if Catton was six one, more physical, we're looking at a top five easy pick here. Right. The, those those little traits can make a huge difference come playoff time, come time yeah. to win. And that's what you want, right? When you're drafting, Grant, you mentioned this, right? You did. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you, you you're drafting to win the cup, <laughs> not the Memorial Cup, right? So um, that's I think that's a really, really good way of putting it. But again, we, we are Berkeley cat and lovers here, okay? Don't come at us. <laughs> we do love his game. Just, we you know, there's just so much talent in this draft that okay. he, he could cat. go out of the top 10. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a cat on a hot tin roof, you know, really kind of cat and cat in a hot tin roof. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know about that one. <laughs> we'll work on those. We'll work on those. Oh boy. Boomer, <laughs> boomer humor. You young lads wouldn't. That's that was a very famous uh, movie from the, I don't know, sixties. Anyway, let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so Rocco, it's time for Rocco's Riser of the Week. You like to highlight Mr. Jet Luchenko. Yeah. Do it. Yeah, sure. Oh. <laughs> okay, put the uh, put, around, put the other one first. Actually, it doesn't really matter, I guess. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah, there we go. That's great. So uh, Jet Luchenko, so number seven for the Guelph Storm. So this first video against Saginaw, this is the game that I was at. I spoke about it last week a little bit. So I wanted to show a couple of his highlights um, from this game because I thought he played quite well. So uh, speaking of small guys, he's a 5'10", 165-pound center. But 
Um, we're debating him on uh, on the first round, not inside the top 10. So it makes a little more sense. But we're going to give the small guys a little credit because he is quite a player. He's got 20 goals and 65 points and 61 games played this year on on a team that's not not the strongest. He, he carries a good chunk of the weight there um, in, in Guelph. They're not having the, the best season. Uh, Jet is, is an absolutely perfect name for him. He says, don't call me Benny, but he is a Jet, as you can see there through the oh, video. His, his speed is his... His speed is his greatest asset for, for sure. Um, and it's not just straight line speed. He's got the whole package with his feet. Um, the top end speed, the quickness, the agility, uh, his change of pace, they're all they're all really, really, really high end. He's amongst he's amongst the most ex explosive and the, amongst the more exciting skaters to watch in this draft. He really is a treat um, when he when he gets going. You can see him just he just burns by guys on a, on a regular basis. He gets guys, he gets good players flat footed. And that says something um, really deceptive. He can turn it on in an instant where he, he'll be almost standing still in two strides. He's in full speed and you don't know where he went. So there's a lot to like about that. Cause that's a very, very, very useful tool to have um, the way the game's played today. Um, aside from the skating, he is quite a good playmaker. Um, 45 assists on the year so he is more of a playmaker than a goal scorer although he can shoot the puck he can shoot the puck decent i don't think uh, it's not like he has a weak shot or anything there's a, there's a nice assist he had there he did a nice job looking off that guy um looking off that guy to open the lane and you know no one saw the back door except him so that's nice that's a play that would translate well to an nhl power play you see that kind of play all the time so i think he's got the uh, the puck skills and the playmaking where he can bring some some offensive uh, some offensive ability to the next level um, and not just be a speed a speedster specialist weaknesses obviously size is kind of the biggest one um, and you can roll the london video as, as well next while i'm uh, while i'm going on here the size is obviously the, the biggest concern at, at 510 165 he's both short and thin so you know unlikely that the height's going to change but the other one will have to he is going to need to beef up and fill out significantly if he hopes to have, you know, if he hopes to have a long career and, and being able to sustain, sustain, sorry, the, the rigors of the day in day out that come with, with pro hockey, it's a physical game and 165 pounds. I don't much like your chances to play a really, really long time without getting hurt. So the other thing with him is I don't know that he's, you know, he's a center and junior. I don't know that he plays center at the next level. And it goes back to what we were saying previously i i really do like him um as a winger at the next level not sure that i would draft him with the intent of having him down the middle but there's been five there's been small quick centers before him so maybe maybe he will um in terms of upside i i do see some top six top six upside here i think that he's a guy that could probably play with guys who are better than him because he has the speed and the speed in the playmaking to keep up with with more elite players at the next level, he should be able to fit in. And, and even if he's not the guy that can carry the offensive load, might be kind of, a, might be a really nice plug and play piece where he can play on any of your lines almost and, and kind of fit in um, because he does have, he does bring a lot of effort and a consistent effort, which is, which is good. And despite his size, he's not scared out there. He's not soft. I mean, he's not, He's not going to go blow bodies up, but he's he's definitely not soft. He'll go dig. He'll take a hit to make a play. He'll go in the dirty areas. So I'm not really worried about that. Um, so that gives him a little versatility, and it gives him a nice floor because you have the effort level with the speed. At worst, you're going to turn into a, a really good bottom six that has some some dangerous ability as a penalty killer on the second power play unit. So um, I do like his floor. Um, in the sense of being able to develop into a pretty consistent everyday player. And and again, there is some upside there because I do think he has some nice puck skills to go along with the, with the speed. So I could see him developing into a, into a pretty decent second line player as well. Um, in terms of where I project him, I like I like him anywhere outside the top 20, really. I think he, I do think he is a first rounder um, for me, despite despite the size. Um, so I'm, I must really like him because, I mean, I admitted earlier, I, I, I tend to judge guys a little bit if they're if they're too small. Um, so I could see him going towards the last third of the first round. Um, 
I, I'd be surprised if he gets outside of the first, but if he does, you're getting a really, really good value pick early in the second. Um, I've got a lot of time for this player. He brings some very projectable attributes. Um, like I said, really nice high floor with the, with the speed and the effort level. Um, and he's, he's got a good heart there, I think, too. So um, I, I've got all the time in the world for a guy like that, and uh, you, you find a role for him. Mm-hmm. If he uh, if he's if you were to be told that he's 5'11", 180, might you consider that he's a top twenty guy? Yep. Okay. Well, the uh, I think he has the ability. I think he has the skills and the ability to be in that okay. top twenty. But at yeah. five tens tough. One sixty five is even tougher. Yeah. Um, so there's there's some hesitancy there. But it, but again, these are the guys that I'm I'm typically undervaluing a little bit. So it's it's possible that that's the case again. Well, central scouting midterm rankings, whenever you go to do a prospect or whatever, have a look at that because that's your uh, guy. That's that's they the gospel, know, right? And they've he's got him at 180. 5'11", 180. And he's mm. grown during the season, actually. And he's immature. The, the guys seem to think that he might end up actually being six foot. They think that maybe the growth plates aren't closed on him yet and he's still uh, maturing. Because, I mean, he's already grown an inch, right? In in season, yeah. He's literally rising. He's so, <laughs> literally yeah, rising. There you yeah. go. So <laughs> uh, I do have him top 20. Um, we've got him at 18 right now. And uh, in part, it's because of that growth uh, spurt that he did. But I guess maybe I, I neglected to tell you that. Rocco. Yeah, no, and, and that's and that's fine though, and that's one of, that's one of those things too that I think like a full time team scout, you're going to have an opportunity, like you're going to have a little more knowledge, like how big are the parents, yeah. like what what how old is the kid when he when he hit puberty, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. What's his? Does he have a grizzly face or a baby face still? So you kind of and that's and that's things that you get more into the details when you're really digging into into players. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, hey. At six foot, you know, at six, if he ends up six foot, 185 pounds, then somewhere in the 15 to 20 range makes, makes a little more sense. Yeah. yeah. For me, because I'm just worried, you know, the, the, the worry, the worry is breaking down, I think a little bit, cause he play he does play hard. So if you're small and you play hard, you can be prone to injury. But I mean, if he's a late bloomer, still growing that sort of thing. And um, that's something that would, that would definitely make me take a, yeah. a second, uh, a second look at that at exactly where I have him. I mean, he's, I have him early twenties for myself personally, but that would make a, that, that would might make a difference if he's growing in season still, certainly. Yeah. Well, I mean, if he does grow another inch and he's 180 right now, like he might be six foot one ninety five, which you know at yeah, the NHL right. level. Like, and I, I get it. Like I, I did it. I didn't stop yeah. growing personally. I was twenty one. Like I, I graduated high school. I was seventeen. I was five nine, and I topped out at that's at over six feet. So it, like, it yeah. happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Well, and uh, I, I mean, as far as that, he's from what I've been told from some some guys that are that are OHL scouts that have seen him fairly often um they really like his defensive game and uh because he's now 5 11 180 and they think that he's gonna you know even grow maybe a little more i think most of them uh, wouldn't be surprised if he stayed at center uh because of his defensive his attention to defensive detail that they think so we'll see i mean uh and again at 185 that makes a big difference in the yeah yeah and he's such a good skater too. Like it's not like it, pace is such an important part of playing center. Uh, you know, if you're going to be playing against other teams' top three centers, you got to be able to handle the pace. And there, there's no question with that with Luchenko or his competitiveness, and his defensive hockey sense is good too. So, yeah, he he might be a guy. I think NHL guys, at least, if if you were to ask them who they think. That stands a better chance of playing center at the NHL level. I think most of them would would maybe give the edge to Lachenko over Catton at the end of the day. He's a little bigger, he's faster, a uh, little more competitive. Uh, goes to the, you know, especially defensively. So, um, but yeah, I, I like that uh, those great descriptions of him. And I just want to add those, you know, that he's a little bigger than than Rocco was aware of. And um, for that reason, more than anything, you know, he might even be uh, 
uh, which would boost him into the top 20, maybe even on Rocco's list. Right. You like when I, when I mentioned that to you, so yeah, he's I right, think you know, right around 15 right to 25, around. I think is a good yeah, slot yeah. for him. Right. Yep. And uh, we'll, again, we'll see in the playoffs and it's the same thing. And I didn't get to mention with Catton, but, Spokane's probably going to end up eighth seed in, in the West, and they'll uh, they'll play either, you know, they'll play one of the top uh, two teams, Portland, and uh, I can't think of who the the top the other top seed is. But if they, you know, if he put has a spectacular playoff and they uh, they pull an upset in the first round, hmm. you know, that's going to raise his draft stock. But they'll likely lose, and he'll likely go to the under-18s, which I almost prefer because uh, then you're up against a lot of your peers. It's peer on peer, right? And uh, and it, again, if he has a if he has a really good first round, but they lose in the playoffs, which is probably what'll happen, goes to the U18s and scores a goal a game again, like he did in Halenka in the summer, and in, in you know captain. I'm sure he'd be the captain of the team again and hmm. leads him to a gold medal and he's the best player. You know, maybe uh, it's hard to, to pass on him in the top 10 at that point too, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not closing the book on him being a top 10 guy yet. That's for sure. Oh, so. and, it's only and March. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Even if, and even if he doesn't get drafted top 10, that's not to say that he might not be one of the 10 best players oh like, no what did Matt Bar what did Barzell go 15 16 7 like something in the mid first round right Kyle Connor and, yeah yeah, yeah. And that 2015 in, draft oh, yeah. was just but well, I mean, he, he wasn't but it, Connor's different he's a he's, six, he's talking about size whatever. similar size guy I think yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. Barzell was a small guy but, but that's part and parcel one of the reasons why he fell I mean they were, had doubts about his goal scoring which that's a different conversation but he was not the biggest guy right and he fell to yeah. the mid round but Again, like look how it developed. He's a point of game centerman, so you know that's not to say that that Catton can't take that same path, even if he doesn't go in the top ten, which he still may. Right. Yeah. I think where, um, I mean, there were guys that had that had that I knew that had Barzell top ten in his draft year. And he's one of those guys that you know just uh, all it takes is one team, right, to have like one guy a little more, and he ended up dropping a bit. Boston, obviously, like three guys a little more. <laughs> he dropped, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think they dropped the ball on that one. Thank goodness. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Barzell, a, a different level skater than yeah. Catton. Yep. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, which. I just, I just meant a little bit of an undersized guy. No, that no, 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 for sure, for sure, for sure. But, I mean, the, just where, you know, you, you could see him trans – becoming a point per game guy uh, at the NHL level, maybe a little more so, but it's funny now, even, you know, once he picked up Horvat, where's Barzal been playing mm. on the wing, right? He's a winger now too. Clayton Keller, another five ten guy that was just set records in junior with the under 18 team. He's a winger now because he couldn't handle the, you know, down low against the freaking top two NHL centers, he just he, no, he was like, better off moving to the wing. So, like, what is what is a guy what is a guy that big going to do against Ansi Kopitar or Sasha Barkov? Like, what do you like? What yeah. are you what are you going to do against? Like, right? No, you're, 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 they're going to bully you for fun. So, yeah. Like, how are you supposed to be a number one center if if every number one center pushes you around? Right. Yeah. Unless yeah. you're, you know. Unless you're a freak like uh, Sidney yeah, Crosby, that's fine. Right? Unless you're unless you're that level where you're just better than yeah. everybody, Crosby, Bedard, whatever. Yeah, doesn't, doesn't doesn't matter. But when you're you know you're equal skill level and six inches shorter, I'm sorry, it makes a difference. Definitely, that's it. All right, Grant, we're sending it over to you for prospect of the week. You'd like to highlight Mr. Yegor Surin? Let's have a yeah. look. Yeah, we had him early on in the year. If you've been watching the podcast as a Mahler of the week. Or first mm -hmm. ever. And so we know that he can hit, right? But, uh, I mean, I did a uh, an article that I posted last week with six videos, uh, you know, showing why <laughs> I think this guy is the most underrated prospect in this draft class. And, uh, well, the MHL playoffs started 
he's played four games and he has 10 points Jeez. in those four games. So he's only, you know, make me look like a genius from that story that I, that I posted last week. Right. But I figured at playoff time, look at this and then check this out. Ding. Oh, cheeky. You know? Yeah. No, he's just so competitive and, and he's got the skill and the vision on top of it. I just, for me, you know, you talk about uh, Catton or whatever. I'd uh, honestly almost look at this guy with Montreal's pick. That's how much I wow. like him. Wow, that's how much I like him. And certainly with the uh, with the pick uh, with the second first round pick, if Cernan's on the board yeah. there, I think he's just a perfect uh, perfect addition to the Canadians with his grit and skill level combination. I. Uh, I see him being a, an impactful top nine forward and uh, that could play in your top two. Um, he plays center and wing. I love this uh, this highlight here. He's check out the face off win here. Bing, mm, pretty nice. But uh, he gets to pucks. He's one of the best four checking prospects that I've ever scouted. Uh, and on top of that, he's grown in the last year. He was listed at five ten last year. He's now listed at 6'1". So there's been a growth spurt with this kid. Hmm. But he's got really good uh, edges and really quick. So skating is is uh, definitely above average. Um, he's got a very good shot, really good playmaker. But his competitiveness to me is the is the, the, the best thing about him. So um, if this kid's playing in the OHL or whatever, I think he's, he's top 15 and – a lot of guys draft lists, but hey, we're all he's rushing, and all we're seeing is the are the videos, right? So, uh, there's going to be questions, obviously. Um, but I mean, Demidov's going to go top five despite that. So, why do you, uh, you know, if this kid's got all that everything that I say he's got, why do you penalize him any more than you know? Than you would Demidov, so or Demidov, as they say in the Russian broadcast. I guess mm -hmm. that's how how it's pronounced. But um, he's off to the second round. They won the first, and I'll be interested to see once the competition gets a little little harder, the see if the the point totals drop off. But as I suspected, I thought he'd be a playoff performer, and I mean. The next guy, I think he's put two and a half points per game so far in the playoffs, and the next guy's like at about a point and a half. So uh, he's he's standing out just as I I figured he would, and um, I look forward to seeing him in the next round. Uh, what we saw last year with Simashev and Boot mm. was, and this was with NHL lists and independent lists, but especially NHL lists. After the season was finished and the scouts, you know, they're no longer going to games. They're looking at a lot of video. And one of the guys and two of the guys, obviously, that they looked at a lot last year were Boot and Simashev. And all, they rose more than any other prospects did after the season ended. And I really think that uh, Surin, like I don't, I think I'm the only... Uh, Recruits is the only list that has him as a top first round guy. And I now have him top 20. And uh, I mean, if he keeps doing what I, what I've been seeing, I I'm not going to hesitate to have him top 15. I think he, I think he's one of the best prospects in this draft class. And he's a sleeper of the week, prospect of the week, mauler of the week, the whole shebang. Yep. Yeah. 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 Love it. <laughs> Yeah, that's. I mean, that's always enticing, right? When you got the yeah. whole package, you look wow. good. Yeah, yeah, he's he's very skilled, and but uh, what I love is the just the combo of his of his uh, skill and his uh, competitiveness. Um, I sent some, uh, like I say, I did that uh, that article last week, and I had six videos in it of him. So I mean, I like I love the kid. Um, but I don't know if you got a chance to look at it, at, uh, at it, Rocco, but, uh, just this hits highlights, go and have a look hmm. and just, it just every two out of every three guys that he hits, he knocks on their ass. 
Like it just, he, this guy's, uh, you know, Bob Rob likes to use the term unicorn. Well, this is a Russian unicorn. This, this, uh, wh whatever. I don't know how you translate that. I'm going to look up unicorn in Russian and that's what I'm going to start <laughs> describing them as. Oh boy. So, yeah. I, I, find, I find with the, the Russians, I find there's almost like, there's not that many neutral Russians. You either really <laughs> want them on your team or you really don't like, Yeah. you know, they're either, they're either, had Darius Kasparitis or Alex Salmon, like they're one, yeah. or the, they're, they're one or the other. Right. And if this guy looks like he's got, because like some of them are like really, really just mean and physical and, and mm -hmm. strong and, you know, you know, big Russian, like the stereotypical cartoon, big Russian ox, you know, like, you know, I always see Natchushkin. I, I love Natchushkin, but, the, but there's an example of one, right. Big, strong, like you want that guy on your, on your team and, but they can go the other way and become, you know, yeah. Soft yeah. as baby, yeah, whatever. yeah. But, yeah. Um, but this no, that that's good. If you if you've got that kind of if you've got that competitiveness and that and that edge to you, which I think some of them some of them do. You, you might they got to be like Canadian. You got to be a certain level of crazy to live in that level of cold. You know what I mean? So those are the ones. Those are the ones that, that you want. I mean, and if you and if he's like that, I I take that kind of thing on my team any day. Yeah. Well, he's the most competitive player I think in his draft class and. I don't think you often see that in a in a Russian, you know. Mm -hmm. Typically, when they are very competitive, they're big, like Nikushkin, or you know, this kid's like he's six one, but he's not huge, right? But he plays yeah. like he's six four and just steamrolls people. And uh, he's a very rare Russian prospect, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And I think uh, you know uh, the guys that do their homework are going to uh, look at his competitiveness and get his background but he wore a c at the under 18s for russia uh that's that's all big. year yeah, yeah that's big. leadership so the, they love his character you know he's the first line center on the u18 team they played the u20 team and uh beat them in a recent tournament and he uh he was hard on chernishov who is supposed to be the second best forward prospect i like this kid more than chernishov um, wow. way more competitive, way more consistent, uh, meaner, faster, just, I think you're going to see him rising on, on draft lists as, as, uh, time goes along here. Right on, right on. So Yegor Surin, not the first time we talk about him, won't be the last either. Uh, great stuff there from Grant. Rocco, uh, we know you got to get going here, but, uh, thank you for your time as always and your insights. We'll see you next week, my friend. Take care. Right on. Have a good one, guys. Thanks. All sure. right, it's time for our Habs prospect of the week. This week, we are highlighting a defenseman that will give even more headaches to Kent Hughes when it comes time to <laughs> decide who the future is. That being Adam Engstrom uh, over in Sweden. So let's have a look. Look at this very first. Uh, look at this clearing pass. Like, looks like a simple clearing yeah. pass, but I mean, Still perfectly executed. Brad Gushu would be envious of that, of the weight that he had on that, you know, he didn't even need the sweepers for that to put the puck mm -hmm. right in the button, you know, to avoid the icing call. I just, I thought that was, you know, it, w it was a little thing, but I thought it was really cool. It and is. again, you know, reversing the puck smartly. Um, he he's, doesn't make that many mistakes back there. He's pretty poised for a 20 year old kid playing in the mm -hmm. SHL 18 minutes a game. Uh, pretty impressive, but, the first few highlights here are from the, his last regular season game, which was just yesterday and, or two days ago, they shut out Modo to clinch a playoff berth. Now Rogla went three and one in their final four games to jump from 12th place to 10th, grabbing the final playoff berth for, and they're starting off today in the playoffs. So hmm. in those four games that they went three and one, the club only gave up four goals and Eng Engstrom was on the ice for just one goal against while, contributing a point in every game, including a game-winning goal and a game-winning assist. Um, his numbers weren't earth-shattering this season. I mean, 22 points in 51 games isn't fantastic, but when you consider that he's a 20-year-old defenseman, you know, uh, playing in the SHL, he was sixth in the, on the club in scoring and just eight points behind the team leader. So obviously Rogla is not a high-scoring team if their top scoring player at 30 points in 52 games. So, mm, yeah. you know, so when you look at it in that, you know, in, in that aspect, it becomes a lot more impressive that he even 
had that many points, you know. Um, I like him on – he plays regularly on their power play, and he's really smooth. Like, he, he has good vision and agility. He makes sure that his passes are well protected and they can't be intercepted. Like, he just – you know, you know that the puck isn't going to, I mean, that's important, right? You're, you're making the cross pass and if it gets intercepted, it's a breakaway going the other way. And the worst thing you want is a shorthanded goal against, but two or three years from now, there, there's not going to be a lack of point options for the Canadians on the power play. When you think nope. about it, you know, like they, they're going to have obviously Hudson, Ryan Bacher, pardon me, Mayu. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Jack Eyes has showed that he can play on the power play. Yeah. Gooley down the road might even be able to play some on the power play. Like they, I wouldn't be, you know, teams getting away from having two defensemen on the power play, but down the road, I wouldn't be surprised, especially if Montreal's leading the game and they get a power play. Mm -hmm. You're going to see the Canadians putting two, two defensemen out there. You know, because uh, you you want to guard against the the shorthanded goal against if you've got a lead, right? Yeah. But uh, I mean, what, what what's what stood out for me this year in, in watching him quite a bit is just he continues to get to improve his skating. Now his, uh, I mean, the, the highlights are, have come and gone, but if if you were looking at them, you'll notice how quick his first two steps are. Not so important in your own zone when you're trying to get to loose pucks, uh, being able to, you know, get there quickly, right? With the first quick couple of steps. When you add in that he's 6'2", has good long reach, he gets to a lot of loose pucks first. And that's so important, uh, especially when you're running around in your own zone a bit and the puck gets, you know, it gets over to the boards. If you can get to the puck first, get it out, uh, you know, relieve the pressure. It's so important. Uh, from a defensive standpoint, and Engstrom's got that. He, I mean, there was a bit of a knock in his draft year that he still got to improve his skating. Well, he's done that, yeah, uh, in spades over the last two years. And uh, skating is not an issue. In fact, I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's a strength of his mm -hmm. as well. So we saw it, right, Shane? We saw him at the uh, he stood out development camp. Just mm -hmm. he looked like a pro, you know. He yep. could step right into the AHL, no problem, out of camp last year. And uh, I, you know, they're they're probably, they're playing qualifiers right now. So they might win that, but it's a best of three. So it'll be over quickly. <clears throat> then they'll move up and play like the top seed or the second seed, depending, uh, in the next round. Well, they won't be favored there and... Odds are that he's going to probably be done in or about the end of March with the season. Mm -hmm. That's still, uh, you know, 10 games left in the AHL season, something yeah. like that. Uh, they, you know, they could use him. They could use him in Laval. Bring him, uh, bring him up at him and Reinbacher. Nice when you can add a top four Ooh. pairing, uh, to, you know, to your lineup. Um, you know, Mr. Norlinder, I'm I'm, I'm afraid uh, his uh, his AHL days, uh, Montreal days, will be coming to an end. Uh, mm. Maybe Gallopo, you know, like these guys are an upgrade on those guys. They're not bad a AHL defensemen, but these kids are, you, you know, they're they're going to be NHLers. And mm -hmm. right now, he's a good SHL defenseman, which make will make you a good. AHL defenseman, you know, there'll be maybe a little growing pains, get used to the, the size of the rink and all that. But we saw at the, uh, development camp, he, he adjusted pretty quickly to, uh, oh, yeah. to the smaller rink. So I, I, I think he, he plays regularly with the Val quickly if, and when he comes over. And I think that'll be, he'll definitely be coming over once the season ends. And that's likely before the end of March. Mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, again, like I mentioned, it's 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 a problem for Kent, but it's a good problem to have. You, you can never have too many good defensemen. So uh, I think the fact that Engstrom is a left shot could hurt his his odds. But again, it, it's it's all about the competition at the training camp, just proving yourself. And, and you know, at that point, you, you really have the best defenseman and then the rest 
Well, you can put him in Laval or you can trade him, right? Every team needs good defensemen. So they become valuable trade assets. Uh, it's, like I said, just a good problem to have. And hey, if, yeah. if Engstrom actually makes the team and, and can be a part of the Habs for a long time, that'd be fantastic, right? He was, what, when was he drafted? Like fourth, third, fourth round, right? Yeah. He's, yeah. So that's really good value. Again, it's a great value pick. Uh, can't complain about that. So Adam Engstrom, our Habs prospect of the week. And that'll do it for us this week. Oh, you got something. He went in the 80s, uh, uh, so third round. Yeah, I believe it was the 80s. So he was a later third round pick or 92 yeah. or 82 or 92, something like that. So, yeah, well, great value, great pick. And, yeah, I, I mean, when I say he's in any, you know, he, he'll play in the NHL, it definitely may not be with the Canadians, it, mm -hmm. you know long term because there's just so much so much left defense depth there but i think this kid could play on the right side too you know he's uh he has played yep. on the right side uh at, at the shl level already and and didn't look out of place ghoulies look decent on the right when he's played harris yeah. you know all these guys uh, one of them at least one of them is going to end up on the right for now i think um and that's fine but yeah, uh, he's got NHL written all over him. It might be a year or two, but uh, he'll be a welcome addition to Laval when he comes. Yeah, he's got that profile. I mean, listen, Kent Kent has uh, treated us to some pretty nice uh, third third round picks there with with Jacob Fowler. Uh, mm. You know, so <laughs> people people complaining about the Jake Allen trade. Just just think about what the Habs have gotten in the third round, and and I think you'll be pretty pleased. <laughs> with yeah, I think, there. yeah, I guess he was a Bergevin of Timmons pick, I guess, say eh? their last draft. If, yeah, if he's Engstrom. 20. My math is off. Yeah. He wasn't well, he wasn't a 2021 guy, no. Yeah, he was. So okay. But 2022 yeah, was so that's uh, much was used his first draft. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So and he's then, uh, guy, but... Yeah. Hey, hey we yeah. Again, third round pick, so yeah, <laughs> good value there. Good value. You know, there. Uh, um, I mean, like at the end of the day, look at the way Primo played the other night. Seventh, you know, yeah. Uh, Josh Joshua, Wall, fifth. Uh, yeah. You know, Jordan Harris I, has been good. Uh, yeah. Mayu is a seventh as well. Like, yeah, Jake Evans. I didn't leave Bergevin and Timmons. You know, like you, you can talk about their faults or this or that, but they didn't leave. They definitely didn't leave the cupboard. Uh, empty you know uh caulfield i mean i can go on and on there's uh oh yeah that they, they uh you know that as we are finding out now and i kept stressing for years that uh canadians have drafted well lately you just don't know yet because they're not you know they're not in the nhl yet but they will be and you'll see just how how well they did draft uh the last few years that they were they were with the canadians and uh we're starting to see, you know, they're starting to bear the fruits of that. So, I mean, they keep signing all these guys and they keep making the team and they keep making impressions. So um, Kent by no means didn't, uh, he didn't inherit a, uh, an empty cupboard. That's for sure. Not at all. Not at all. But he's been filling it out pretty well as well. Oh, so uh, no, no. great job there. And he's going to keep doing future, a great job, especially if he listens to this show, right? If he listens to this show, he's going to keep doing a good job. <laughs> Go. He's going to get some good prospects out of us. So, um, yeah, that's that's about it for us this week. We appreciate your support. We appreciate you tuning in. Um, and, and you can head over to recruits.ca to find more articles like the one Grant wrote about Yegor Surin. You can find as well um, scout testimonials. You know, Grant interviews scouts all the time and player profiles, the whole shebang, everything you need to know about the draft, anything you need to know about the Habs, it's all there. Two dollars a month. Price. Their so, uh, draft coverage. Two dollars a month. So it's a fantastic investment, if you ask me. So uh, head on over there and and don't forget to click subscribe. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think about Berkeley Cat and if you think he's be a top ten pick. If you want your team to select him, let us know. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Until then, we'll see you next week. Take care. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast Recruits Draftcast on YouTube, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.